Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Michael Walker, of course. I'm joined by Ash Saka, my distinguished co-host, colleague. Ash, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm glad that you summoned me here to speak for all of the UK's Muslims with regards to this Keir Starmer story that's coming up. I love it when I get to speak on behalf of my people. We will be doing a live poll of one Muslim. Um, you can see if she'll be voting Labour at the next election, what that means. Uh, we do have some proper polls for you as well. Um, coming up later tonight, um, the mother of Brianna Jai has given a really moving interview to the BBC where she talks about some changes um, she'd like to see um, after the tragic murder, of course, of her daughter. We'll also be speaking um, about a really radical president who has won a stomping majority in El Salvador. Some awkward questions for the left there because he, he he doesn't really have much respect for liberal values, but he's very, very popular nonetheless. Um, and we have some scenes from an interview um, between Rishi Sunak and Piers Morgan. So it's just over a week since the UK, the United States and other allied countries agreed to defund UNRWA. So UNRWA um, is the UN's refugee Agency for Palestinians. Um, it is um, the main agency providing food, shelter, education, and healthcare to Palestinians. So it was a very consequential decision to defund it. And the circumstances under which that decision was made are still incredibly opaque. Earlier today, I spoke to the former chief spokesperson for UNRWA, Chris Gunness, who believes the decision by the UK and US to defund UNRWA should be subject to an independent investigation. This decision by Britain and 15 other member states of the UN, donors, the main donors to UNRWA, appears to be based on what I'm now calling the dodgy dossier. It's been sent to lots of media outlets and actually only really the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal were prepared to stake their integrity and their good name on this. So they went big time. The New York Times splashed it across the front page. The BBC Financial Times said there were you know, some serious question marks. It actually said it didn't provide um, the proof of what the Israelis were arguing. And now we hear that the Israeli intelligence echelons are themselves quite horrified this thing has got out in the public. So, you know, there's clearly something to be asked upon the, about the basis upon which this decision was made, the evidence. The fact that it hasn't been passed on to the UN, any evidence has been, no evidence has been passed on to UNRWA. That's, you know, I think condemnable. Um, but the, the fact is, standing back from even the poor evidence, this is abysmal donorship. It is a violation of the humanitarian principles of neutrality and impartiality. It's a violation of international humanitarian law because it's clearly instrumentalizing such things as food aid. And to be clear, there are 1.2 million people in Gaza on UNRWA's food list and a result of this shameful suspension of nearly half a billion dollars worth of aid those people may slip from starvation. Sorry, they may slip from hunger into starvation. And some are saying that the signs that you have technically of starvation, infantile malnutrition, um, such things are already going on. Um, it's also this decision, a violation of the judgment on the 26th of January on provisional measures, which made it clear that nobody should squeeze humanitarian aid what do these donors do almost, you know, within a day or so, they squeeze humanitarian aid. And then very finally, it's arguably a violation of the Genocide Convention, because the Genocide Convention says that no, nobody should, 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 should create conditions of life, as they call it, which are aimed at destroying the group in whole or in part. And as I've just said, this is very likely to lead to mass starvation. And that's according to um, UN agencies who are working in Gaza. So, you know, that's why. And, and, and perhaps my third large point is that UNRWA is being accused by the donors of instrumentalizing humanitarian aid. It's saying, you, you know, you've, you've done these terrible things. Hamas have taken you over. Aid of UNRWA has been instrumentalized. Well, I'm sorry, the spotlight needs to be turned back on the donors. They have instrumentalized aid. They, they have instrumentalized aid. They have uh, weaponized UNRWA. And we need to have a proper investigation into the extent to which our tax dollars, tax pounds, tax whatevers that go to fund humanitarian aid, that that money is properly ring fenced from political influence. So I would like to see just as people are saying, let's have an investigation into UNRWA, which clearly the Secretary General has just announced that there will be that 
There's also the Office of Internal Oversight in New York, which is investigating the specific allegations against the 12. I gather it became nine, and now it may even be four. I don't, I'm not privy to that decision. Um, but I think it's important for us to get to the bottom, certainly, of what went on within UNRWA. And I think UNRWA would be extremely transparent. I've no doubt that Commissioner General Lazzarini, a man of great integrity, will lead it, will allow this investigation um, to go to, to take place in, in an atmosphere of complete transparency and accountability. But I want to see the transparency and the accountability from the donors. The boot is now on the other foot. The news management, the leaking of this document just so quickly after the ICJ ruling, the news management is unraveling. And I fear or I suspect that the donor embarrassment is about to begin. When you say sort of this decision was politically instrumentalizing aid, so I suppose withdrawing aid to achieve a political aim, I mean, what would that aim be when we're talking about the United States and the United Kingdom? I know lots of people are saying about Israel, what they want to do is, you know, starve the people of Gaza so they have no choice but to leave. But why would why would the United States, the United Kingdom want to get involved in this in this way? I mean, they're actually part of they support the war. Um, diplomatically and politically. I mean, you saw both Britain and the Americans blocking a ceasefire resolution in the Security Council. And we know that America is supplying $4 billion worth of aid, of military aid to, to um, Israel. We know also that, you know, Akrotiri, the base in, in Cyprus, that's being used by British forces. We're not, the British government's not exactly being transparent about that. Um, but, you know, Private Eye had an excellent piece about this not that long ago, the British magazine Private Eye, and it was very clear, um, you know, that these bases were used. So um, I think we need to um, understand that the idea of seeing Britain and America as being somehow objectively looking on as part of the donor community, I mean, that simply flies, flies in the face of what we know is happening on the ground. And as you quite rightly say, as far as the far right in Israel is concerned, and increasingly, you know, the centre ground of Israeli politics, they clearly feel that the moment has arrived in which they, they need to seize this moment it's a sort of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to defund and dismantle UNRWA as if doing that would get rid of the refugees as an issue and get rid of their right of return. I mean, that's the sort of, you know, that's the big stated aim um, of the Israelis. And it's very clear, as has, has happened, I mean, it's pretty transparent that in many ways, America, you know, key ally and Britain, special relationship, um, that they're very much, um, you know, doing Israel's bidding. Even the Labour Party. You know, none of us will ever forget um, Keir Starmer's LBC interview and, you know, whether he's retracted or not. He did instinctively, his knee-jerk reaction was to back Yoav Galant, the Israeli defence minister, who'd called for a total blockade, no food, no water, no electricity. So there's ample reason for suspecting that Britain, you know, and America are doing Israel's bidding. You Because it's sort of on the record. You just need to Google it, frankly. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. At all. So, you know, that's another reason why it would be good to have an independent investigation into how this decision was made, because these questions you're asking are utterly legitimate and they should be answered, because this, in a way, is an anatomy of the instru instrumentalization, instrumentalizing of foreign aid. And, you know, we all need to get to the bottom of it in the interest of good donorship. We have to make sure that this never ever happens again. The fact that there is this donor stranglehold by the West is really something that has to change. And by the way, Michael, one thing that could change that is if Arab countries were to come forward and be far more generous than they are. At the moment, these big Western donors are the main donors to UNRWA. So if they want to do something like politically instrumentalize UNRWA, they can do it very easily. But if the Arab states had come forward, this wouldn't be happening. And just to give you one snapshot, the um, oil revenues from OPEC in 2022, which is the latest figures I can find, um, the profit was of OPEC was $888 billion. Now, UNRWA's annual budget, give or take a bit, it changes depending on need, is somewhere in the region of $1.5 billion. That is 0.02% 0, 0 of OPEC's entire oil revenues in 2022. So in a heartbeat, in a nanosecond's worth, of oil revenues, um, the Arab states could be much more generous and they could prevent the West having this political stranglehold over UNRWA. It's nothing to do, you know, we thought they were good donors. There was a relationship, you know, um, but that stranglehold could end. And I mean, the really disappointing thing, and by the way, that should not take the pressure on these Western donors 
to come back. But the really disappointing thing is that we, they and UNRWA, UNRWA has worked with these donors for years on these neutrality frameworks. And if they aren't working, it's as much the, 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 the fault of the donors as it, is the, as it is with UNRWA. And one other really important point I've just thought of, every year, UNRWA supplies the list of all of its staff members to all the host governments, and that includes Israel. So in May last year, the Israeli authorities were given, in digital form, the names of every single UNRWA staff member in both Gaza and the West Bank. They did not come forward with one objection. That list had been run through the Security Council's so-called terrorism list, um, but Israel was also given it. They didn't come back with one single objection. They chose the day after the ICJ had made its ruling to come up with this accusation, to give it to the New York Times and to give it to the Wall Street Journal. As I say, as I say, I'm pleased that other responsible news outlets didn't succumb to this news management. Um, but, you know, Israel also had this evidence. And the reason why Israel is able to come up with these names is because UNRWA was transparent. It has a zero tolerance policy towards these neutrality issues. It fired these people even before the internal investigation up in New York had begun. Um, so, you know, I think what this episode shows actually is what a tiny percentage of UNRWA staff are even, and we don't know for sure, but can have these sorts of fingers pointed at them for these things, you know. And as I say, the Israeli evidence is really, really weak. And that's why so many people in the defense establishment now are quite frankly horrified. They're going to be judged on, the, on, 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 on this threadbare, this dodgy dossier. But, but Western donors who've made this decision, the shameful decision, to inflict this, this punitive, disproportionate decision, they need to be held to account. They need to answer for why they have made this decision to instrumentalize, to weaponize UNRWA, as I say, which could cause hundreds of thousands of people to starve. There are many people who fear that it's starvation, a slow motion massacre that will take more lives than these 2,000 pound Israeli bombs. One of the countries that didn't go along with this move to defund UNRWA was Belgium. And last week, um, lots of people thought it could be significant that the, the building which housed the Belgian Development Agency in Gaza was bombed by Israel. Now, I'm sure Israel would say, you know, this was this was not a targeted attack. But for many people, it seemed like, you know, a bit of a coincidence. I mean, do you think there could be any connection there? Who knows? I mean, maybe Israel will suddenly say there was a Hamas operative in a tunnel underneath it. And that's why we had to destroy the entire building rather than send in commandos to root out this Hamas person. Um, unfortunately, and this is one of the terrible, the terrible difficulties of war crimes investigations. It's only really the Israeli authorities that have the evidence um, that can give can shed some light on what happened. But, you know, this is a very, very vindictive administration. I mean, look at their public rhetoric. They are so vindictive when it comes to anyone who's not full scale behind their political objectives. And so it wouldn't surprise me if this was a vindictive £2,000 bomb or whatever it may have been. But I fear that we will never, ever find out because that evidence is with the IDF. And I mean, you, you spoke earlier about your disappointment that Arab countries haven't stepped up to fund UNRWA. I mean, I've been surprised about that as well, because, I mean, it seems like a kind of easy diplomatic win for the Arab countries or even China to come in and say, look, uh, the West have, have acted without any due process here. They're trying to starve the people of Gaza. We will step up because, yes, this money is significant for the people of Gaza, but for the Gulf states or for China, I mean, this is a, a tiny drop in the ocean. Why do you think they haven't done that? Do you think there's been Israeli pressure to not do so? It's a really interesting question, actually. It's got a lot of political background. Essentially, and if you talk to Arab donors, as I've done many times, their to simplify their narrative, it is the Germans did the Holocaust and drove the Jews into Palestine and displaced seven, you know, 750,000 people, either fled their homes or were forced to flee their homes. Um, and therefore, it's the West, um, the Europeans and the Americans who support the Israelis. It's up to them, the Europeans and the Americans, to pay for the displacement, i.e. to pay for UNRWA. And that argument, that narrative has been there you know, for a very long time. But what I say as a counter argument to the Arab donors, and I've said it many times to them, is look, um, this is a conflict, Gaza and you know, the whole Palestinian question. 
not so much in your backyard, but in your front garden. And now it's led to a, a Middle East conflagration. You've got the Houthis saying this is the cause of war. You've got Hezbollah with, you know, 120,000 Katusha rockets, you know, pointing at Tel Aviv and Haifa and other cities in Israel. And that border is hotting up with Israeli military overflights across into Lebanon every hour, frankly. Um, you've got American soldiers being killed on the Jordanian-Syrian border. You've got Iran attacking positions in Pakistan. You've got, you know, targets in Syria and Iraq being attacked. I mean, this has become, frankly, you could argue already, a Middle East war. And what will that do to oil prices? I don't know. Um, what will it do to stability, the economy of the Arab world? I mean, these are all questions which the Arab states need to answer. But it cuts against, it's a counter argument, if you like, to that narrative I explained earlier. The Palestinian refugee question is absolutely four square, a Middle Eastern and an Arab country. And by the way, the Arab League in the 70s passed a resolution saying that I think it was over 7% of UNRWA's general fund, which is a lot of money, needs to be paid for. But I think in light of what we're seeing now, this Western stranglehold being used by su to such lethal effect and such devastating effect, I think it's time that the Arabs said, you know what, it is our problem. They are our Arab brothers and sisters against whom um, a plausible genocide, if you'll forgive me using the phrase of the ICJ, um, is being perpetrated. And it's high time we stepped up, stepped up to the plate. And by the way, one of the other things in Israel's agenda that we should perhaps mention is that it's, there are some in Israel talking about driving all the people of Gaza into the Sinai, into Egypt. And that, again, makes it an Arab issue. So this Arab line, it's, oh, no, it's a Western problem. UNRWA can deal with it. UNRWA can be funded by the West. No. And this episode, as I say, this, this brutal stranglehold, they could cause, you know, these donors could cause one of the most um, significant existential crises in UNRWA's 70-something year history in a heartbeat, just like that. And I think the stranglehold that gives these countries the ability to do that that needs to be taken away from them. And the best way to do that is for Arab countries to increase their aid to UNRWA exponentially. It's a drop in the ocean, quite literally, when it comes to their oil revenues. That was Chris Gunnis speaking to me earlier today. I'm former chief spokesperson for UNRWA. Um, before we move on, Ash, I can see you've noticed in the comments, um, we've got some big news about the king. Um, Ash, do you want to break it to our audience? So Buckingham Palace have just released a statement saying that King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. Cancer was found during a procedure that was investigating what turned out to be a benign enlarged prostate. And ITV are reporting that the form of cancer that's been identified isn't prostate cancer, but you can have an idea of what kind of cancer it may be considering how it was discovered. I think there are three things here which are significant or important, noteworthy. The first is that this is a remarkable level of transparency regarding the health of a monarch. You might recall that when Queen Elizabeth II died, what was recorded as the cause of death was simply old age. There was very much a veil of silence being drawn around the specifics of uh, Queen Elizabeth's health and once Nicholas Witchell implied that there had been a form of cancer some time before her actual passing, that was mentioned once seemingly by accident on the BBC and then never commented on again. Just like with her father, there was a huge amount of secrecy regarding his actual health and it only became public many, many years after his death. So from the start, King Charles has been a lot more open about matters of his health. Maybe that's a deliberate strategy to try and be a bit more human and maybe even sort of um, be a role model for getting checkups and that kind of thing. The second thing that's of note is that this is really quite early into his reign. Now, the formal powers of a constitutional monarch are quite limited, but what we know about Charles is that he's someone who spent a lot of time being very ambitious. He had a vision for what the role could be. He wanted what he called a slimmed down monarchy. He wanted to get rid of some of the pomp and the circumstance and the mystery. Obviously, with this significant health issue cropping up and having to take a step back from public events, uh, all of those plans are put on ice and we'll see whether or not he gets a chance to follow them through. So the 
changes he wanted to make to how the monarchy functioned, that might not ever happen. And the third thing that would be of note is that, of course, anything that happens with regards to King Charles, there is going to be a huge amount of renewed tabloid speculation about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And I've made a bet with myself that it's going to be less than 24 hours before the Daily Mail and Piers Morgan find a way to make all of this Meghan Markle's fault. You are a very good royal correspondent, Ash. Um, That was very comprehensive. Uh, I suppose apparently he went public with the whole enlarged prostate because he wanted to make people more aware of their prostate so they could go get them checked. And then within a week, by getting his prostate checked, he found another form of cancer. So that is good for public awareness, I suppose. Obviously, if you caught it by looking for something else, hopefully that means it's early. The mother of Brianna Jai has spoken to the BBC about her daughter's murder and her comments about the mother of her daughter's killer were both surprising and incredibly moving. It's incredible to hear you say, though, you carry no hatred towards them. Mm -hmm. Even though they took the life of your daughter, you know, they planned it, they discussed it on messaging apps, you know, that Scarlett had been on the dark web watching videos of violence and torture. And I think you've just shown then again that extraordinary compassion that people around the country have seen in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Scarlett's mother has thanked you for your compassion. I wonder, did you see her in court? Um, I've I've seen her, but but not, we haven't come face to face. But like when I I think of their emotions and how they're feeling, it just brings back how I felt um, when all this happened in February. Um, because, yeah, she, she does. She looks completely broken, really, and, and rightly so. She's she's going through an absolutely horrific time. Is there anything that you would want to say to her? Um, I think that I would like to say that um, if she did want to contact me and she does want to speak, then I'm I'm open to that. Um, I'd like to understand more how like how their life was and what they they went through and I also want her to know that I don't blame her for what her child's done and I also want her to know that uh, it, I understand how difficult being a parent is in this current current day and age with technology and and phones and um, the internet and how hard it is to actually monitor what your child is on. Um, So yeah, if she ever wants to speak to me, I am, I'm here. That's a really remarkable level of of compassion from Esther Jai. So that's the mother of Brianna Jai. She was speaking, of course, just two days after her daughter's murderers were sentenced. And Esther Jai now wants the law changed with regard to young people and social media. We'd like a law introduced so that there um, are mobile phones that are only suitable for un- that are suitable for under 16s. Mm-hmm. So if you're over 16, you can have an adult phone, but then under the age of 16, you can have a, a children's phone, which will not have all of the social media apps that are that are out there now, um, and also to um, have software that's automatically downloaded on a parent's phone, which links the children's phone, mm-hmm. um, and it can highlight keywords. So if a child is searching the kind of words that Scarlett and Eddie were searching, it would then flag up on the adults, on the, on the parents' phone. Um, there is software already available. I know that schools are already using this kind of software so that if students do type something in that's concerning, it then flags up to the teachers. I, f- I feel like it, it's such a simple solution and I don't understand why we haven't actually done something like this already. Why do you think that's needed? Um, so when, when Brianna was, was with us, she struggled with her mental health and she was, um, I found out after she was actually on certain social media sites, um, on pro-anorexia sites and um, self-harm sites, which I wasn't aware of. It got to, when Brianna turned around 14, it was so difficult to monitor, monitor her phone because she wanted that trust and she was, um, she was very protective over her phone. If she couldn't have accessed these sites, she wouldn't have suffered as much. And like I said, they they carried this phone around 24-7 and it's just not, 
it's just not doable for a parent to um, to monitor that. Do you think if some of those safeguards had been in place now and there was a flagging system that might have picked up what Scarlett and Eddie were searching for, mm -hmm. that Brianna might have been safe? Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. I think that if either one, they wouldn't have been searching that in the first place. And two, if they did search it, then the parents would know and they'd be able to get them some kind of help. That was Esther Jai speaking to the BBC. Ash, I suppose a couple of things, you know, comments um, on Brianna's mother sort of speaking so, so movingly, but then also the debate since, you know, the full details about the case were, were published after the sentencing. Um, obviously, you know, there isn't so much reporting during a, during a trial now. We, we, you know, the people have been named, so there's lots more information coming out. Uh, the attention has turned to social media. Do you think that's sensible? I mean, do, do you think this is a cause for, for reform to social media laws? The first thing that was really notable about those clips that you showed was the level of humanity and empathy demonstrated by Esther Jai. This is someone who's lost her daughter in the most brutal and traumatic way possible and for her to be able to empathize with the parents of her child's killers I think is just that's a level of kindness and empathetic capacity that I'm not sure I would be capable of and I think it's really really commendable um I think the discussion on social media I don't have a fully formed take on this. I don't have an opinion that I can just say, okay, here it is. And it's, you know, fully baked. I have some empathy for what she's saying. And if I was a parent, I think I would feel really worried about how much my child was able to conceal from me. Obviously, the thing that you want is a relationship with your child where they volunteer the things that they're thinking about and the things that they're exploring and your relationship is good enough so that you're able to know what it is that's going on in their inner world without having to breach their privacy in some ways but I think all of us who've been teenagers know that that's not possible the nature of a teenager is that you do conceal things from your parents and there's this sort of dance there's this like elastic dynamic about what you conceal being okay with your parents, that they kind of have an idea of what it is, even if they don't really know what it is. With the development of social media and just how much more teenagers are connected to one another and to adult and potentially very harmful and illegal content, that space of a kind of known unknown, I think is a lot broader and, and, and murkier I think that there's, you know, a lot more potential for harm than perhaps that, you know, there used to be. So for me, the question is, what's a healthy level of privacy for a teenager to have? And how do you, you know, moderate that and change that as they grow up or even just being responsive to things which are clear, for instance, if they're really struggling with mental health issues? Because I don't think that it is a... I don't think it's an unalloyed good for a parent to have a total oversight of what their kids are looking at on the internet. For instance, if a child is struggling with their sexuality or their gender identity and they're just they're not ready to be out to their parents yet, I think that privacy is something which is really psychologically important for them to be in control of when they tell their own the story. I think that's something that's really, really critical. So I've got a lot of sympathy with what she has to say and I don't think that it, it's an idea that should just be, you know, chucked out entirely. But for me, the really key point is what's a healthy level of privacy. I think there's another thing which is, I think, a really key part, which is how is it that two very clearly disturbed children were able to slip through a net? How come they weren't identified as having the sort of capacity to harm and commit acts of violence that they very clearly did. So that is more than just monitoring of social media and, you know, electronic communications. That's also about what kind of context they were operating in more broadly. What kind of oversight was there at school? What kinds of channels for disclosure were there if they were saying things that were really, you know, 
disturbing, concerning violent fantasies to other children and other students? Those are answers that I don't have. Those are just questions that I would pose. It's one of those issues where I don't have fully formed opinions either. I mean, I, I haven't thought so much about sort of the privacy element. I do think more about sort of social media just in terms of the general experience of using social media and how it affects your mental health. Because it does seem to me that, you know, there aren't that many things where you regularly hear an adult say, oh, I'm addicted to this and my life would be better without it that we give to kids. Right? So, so it might be drugs, it might be alcohol, it might be cigarettes, gambling. You know, these are all things where someone says, oh, yeah, I'm addicted to that and it's bad for me. I want to quit it, but I can't. We say that about social media all the time. Yet that's the one thing that everyone's addicted to, maybe sugar also, where we just sort of say kids can have it willy nilly. Right. And so it, it does seem to me there's a question. I think the studies to some degree disagree. I mean, there's obviously also an argument that social media has been great for kids. If you're queer, um, you, you can sort of meet people outside of your immediate social situation. There might be many young people who sort of got bullied at school or still do get bullied at school, but now have this escape online where they can meet people like them. At the same time, I think sort of the way that, you know, everyone is a celebrity in their own personal world where you're sort of trying to project an image of yourself is not necessarily good for the development of the brain. But this one to me doesn't seem like a particularly capital P political question. I feel like I, I need to see the studies Naib Bukele is one of the world's most radical presidents, and he's just been re-elected with what appears to be a stomping majority. With 31% of votes counted, Bukele had secured 83% of the vote in El Salvador. That's a Central American country with a population of 6 million people. Um, now, before the election, polls consistently had him with support running into the 70s. So as I say, only 31% of votes counted. I think there was a problem with um, the, the transference of, of sort of the, the voting on the computer system. But everyone seems to agree this guy has won a stomping majority. And here's how he celebrated the victory. In all the history of the world, since the democracy nunca un project había ganado con la cantidad de votos que hemos ganado este día. Es, es literalmente el porcentaje más alto de toda la historia. Bukele's support is largely thanks to his success at radically reducing crime in the country. El Salvador was once known as the murder capital of the world. In 2015, there were 103 murders per 100,000 people in El Salvador. In the year before Bukele was elected, that had fallen to 51 murders per 100,000. That's significantly lower than in 2015. But it was still the highest rate in the world. So when he became president, it was the highest rate in the world, the murder rate. But that rate plummeted under Bukele's leadership, hitting 7.8 per 100,000 people in 2022 and 2.4 per 100,000 people in 2023. 2023, not yet on this chart. Um, for comparison, one person per 100,000 is murdered every year in Britain. In the USA, it's 6.3. So Bukele has you know, a really impressive record from the murder capital of the world to significantly lower than the United States. It has, though, come at a cost. Bukele has instituted a major arrest drive of anyone suspected of being a gang member, and 1.6% of the population are now incarcerated. That is the highest rate in the world. So from the, the murder capital of the world to the incarceration capital of the world. This was a report from NBC last year after El Salvador's police arrested 6,000 suspected gang members in the space of 10 days. A frightening image inside a prison in El Salvador, and President Nayib Bukele wants the world to see. He says it shows gang members punished and kept in crowded cells away from any sunlight since the end of March. Bukele says the food is now being rationed to two meals per day for gang members now facing harsher sentences. For 10 days, the country's national police has been operating with less restrictions. They say they've arrested over 6,000 suspected gang members, tracking them in neighborhoods, inside homes, and even hiding underground. 
the crackdown in response to one of the deadliest weekends in El Salvador. Authorities reporting 67 homicides in a single day, prompting a state of emergency that gave way to mass arrest and tougher punishment to gang members already behind bars. Human rights groups warn the incarcerations lack due process and family members of those incarcerated have spoken of them as being kidnapped by the state. But as today's results prove, the policy appears to be overwhelmingly popular. Joining me now from El Salvador is journalist Hillary Goodfriend. Hillary is an academic at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and has been an accredited observer for this election. Um, first off, when we see election results in the, you know, in the 80s, you know, one might think, is this a free and fair election? Was it, are these real results? I mean, uh, can we sort of get that out of the way first? Does it seem like he genuinely won more than 80% of the vote? Well, first of all, I think it's important to say that we don't have election results yet from El Salvador. About 70% of the presidential preliminary count is in, uh, less than 1% of the legislative results is in. So I think it's important that we be patient uh, as the electoral process unfolds. That said, um, do I think that uh, Bukele has achieved uh, probably over 80% of the votes for the presidency? Yes. Were these free and fair elections? No, they were not. These are elections that unfolded under uh, extraordinary circumstances. This is a country that has been for nearly two years under a state of exception with the uh, indefinite suspension of constitutional guarantees of due process um, and uh, a massive deployment of militarization and security forces across the country, mass incarceration, mass arbitrary detentions. Um, in addition, we're talking about an unconstitutional presidential candidacy. Uh, El Salvador specifically prohibits presidential reelection in no less than six different constitutional articles. Uh, so whether or not these election results are representative of the Salvadoran population's uh, preferences towards the president is one thing, but whether they can be considered free and fair in any conventional sense, I think the answer is no. In terms of the constitutionality, so as I understand it, El Salvador had a you know a single term presidential limit. So you could only be president for one term, and then you had to quit. And he sort of went to the Supreme Court um, and they decided to to change it. Now, you might say, you know, that, that makes it unconstitutional at the same time. You know, it's not really the sign of an authoritarian state that someone can stand for re-election like once in a way, because that's fairly normal around the world. Well, in, it's not in Latin America. Actually, in Latin American countries that have long histories of, of dictatorships and military dictatorships, and El Salvador is one such country, uh, presidential re-election is often prohibited. Um, and that's that's the case broadly in the region. Uh, now, if Bukele had, for example, uh, amended the Constitution, although that, that would have been highly controversial, but uh, amended the Constitution to allow for re-election, that would be one thing, held an, a popular referendum on uh, presidential re-election, uh, that would have also been controversial, but it would certainly be another. Bukele didn't do that. What he did was, once he secured a legislative majority, his uh, deputies illegally fired all sitting magistrates on the Supreme Court and the attorney general and replaced them before the end of their term with uh, sympathizers. And those are the magistrates who ruled on re-election. So the question of the constitutionality of, of re-election, I, I don't think is, is very gray. I think it's, it's actually quite clear. So there are clearly, I mean, issues in El Salvador in terms of constitutionality, as you say, and then also the rule of law. So people are sort of being put behind bars without due process properly being served. But it does seem that he's popular. I suppose my question to you, do you think that the quality of life for the majority of people in El Salvador has improved, you know, over the past few years? Because, you know, it was the case that there was a really high murder rate. Now there's a low murder rate. There was a quote sort of in, the, in, in a BBC report today, actually, it's from Reuters. Um, so saying there was someone who voted for Bukele saying um, he was really grateful that he'd improved, or it was a woman actually, improved the security situation. She no longer had to pay $300 in extortion to the gangs every fortnight. So you can see sort of like, even, even though I feel sort of like liberal NGOs, Western media is going to be saying this guy is terrible for human rights. For your ordinary sort of El Salvadorian on the street, they no longer have to worry about getting killed. They no longer have to pay extortion fees to sort of gang leaders. I mean, would you say that life has got better in the country since Bukele was elected? Sure. So it depends on who you ask. I would say over the course of Bukele's term, uh, the decline in homicide figures 
continued a trend that had begun prior to his arriving in the presidency. And we've also seen uh, maneuvers with statistics that no longer count uh, so-called alleged gang members who are killed in so-called uh, confrontations with the police. We're not seeing the uh, figures on disappearances included in the homicide numbers anymore. So I would, I would cast those figures into doubt. However, I think it is certainly the case that since the state of exception has been enacted and we've seen this mass incarceration of uh, suspected gang members uh, and thousands of bystanders, uh, it's certainly the case that the gangs have retreated from the streets uh, and their activity has been severely diminished in the country. There are a lot of questions as to what are the terms of this retreat, to what degree are their activities uh, actually disarticulated or disruptive, to what degree are we seeing reconfigurations of organized crime in the country with or without the complicity of the authorities. Um, but that said, there are also thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of people in El Salvador who are suffering because a loved one has been arbitrarily arrested and uh, is being held now without trial uh, for months, if not now years, without a right to speak to their family members, without a right to speak to counsel, uh, without access to medical care. We've seen more than 200 documented deaths behind bars of people who had yet to be convicted of any crime. And these are families that are really struggling now. Often we're talking about the sole breadwinners of households, um, families who are struggling to make ends meet and also pay these exorbitant fees that the prisons demand in order to get uh, food and, and medicines into to their loved ones. That's a responsibility that the prisons don't undertake themselves. Um, so I would say that it is absolutely understandable that many Salvadorans feel this at least temporary reprieve from the uh, constant harassment of these criminal structures. And, and there's uh, great hope, I think, that they've placed in Bukele that that is going to be somehow sustainable. However, we know that the underlying causes of organized crime and gang violence in particular in El Salvador that this is a structural phenomenon that it feeds off of extreme poverty and extreme inequality. And these are conditions of El Salvador that Bukele has done nothing at all to address. So uh, in, the, in reality, we're not looking at a sustainable strategy uh, for providing security. Instead, what Bukele has done is cr created a heightened polarized discourse that um, posits as antagonisms, uh, security on the one hand and democracy and human rights on the other. And I would say that that's a false opposition uh, and it's a shame that no other political forces have been able to break through yet to, uh, to, to question that. I've never actually heard Bukele speak. So I'm, but I, from what I've read today, I imagine what he'd say there sort of in response is to say, Yes, there might be theoretical other ways to reduce crime rates, but none of the neighbours have managed to do it. And I was looking today at sort of like countries in terms of the murder rate, and I think 18 of the top 20 are in um, Latin America and the Caribbean. So there are clearly lots of countries who have tried um, to tackle this and, and haven't managed it. And Bukele is probably going to say, look, I'm the guy who got results. And I suppose my question to you is both, you know, how would you respond to that? And two, do you think that, you know, now Bukele has done this one dramatic re-election, we will see sort of a, a repetition of this strategy throughout South America and perhaps the Caribbean. So I would say that um, we haven't seen any evidence uh, to demonstrate yet that Bukele has uh, dismantled uh, definitively these structures. Um, the illicit markets that they feed off of, um, and, and most significantly, of course, the flow of drugs uh, to the United States for consumption, those markets continue to exist, um, as does the massive unemployment uh, from which these criminal structures uh, was able to recruit. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's basically this repressive strategy is, is actually the same uh, mechanism that gave birth to the gangs in the first place. Um, and it's, it's uh, highly unlikely that we've seen in places like Mexico, uh, with the war on drugs, 
Uh, history shows that these kinds of repressive strategies, while they may be able to enact uh, a certain kind of, uh, as I said, reprieve, uh, temporary reprieve from the pressures of uh, uh, on the population, uh, inevitably spawn new and more monstrous uh, criminal formations. Uh, and I think we, we can only expect that. When it comes to re reproducing the Bukele model, I think that's going to, governments are going to find that very challenging in part because the gang violence is unique uh, to the region. And it's, it's not quite the same as the kind of uh, cartel and, and uh, other organized crime structures that operate elsewhere in Latin America. And so it can't quite be so easily attenuated or at least apparently attenuated with just street sweeps, right? Uh, and the massive criminalization of, of poor and working class people, which is what the state of exception has done in El Salvador. Um, it's also uh, very difficult to achieve without full control of all branches of government. Uh, Bukele has no oversight. He has a totally free hand to enact uh, the most arbitrary measures. And, and I, I can't imagine that that can be so easily replicated across the region. And I think that that is for the best. Back in October, amid news that people were leaving Labour over Starmer's stance on Gaza, the journalist Lee Harpin tweeted this, Lab source on the few quitting party over party stance on Hamas, shaking off the fleas. Now that turn of phrase was disowned by the Labour leadership, but their approach to the war on Gaza hardly changed. Exactly one month after Harpin sent that tweet, Labour whipped MPs to vote against a ceasefire. But now, times seem to have changed a bit. Last week, The Guardian published an article saying that Labour had started acting on fears that Muslims would not vote for the party over its Gaza stance. Um, the outreach in question, though, um, was just to do more focus groups. Um, so hardly groundbreaking. And the bad news for Labour when it comes to Muslims has kept coming in. According to a poll by Servation and Labour Muslim Network, Labour's support among Muslim voters is down from 86% at the last election to 60% now. Um, many of those seem to have gone to the Greens and Lib Dems, who are up by 13 percentage points and 8 percentage points, respectively. Um, that's not you know, actually a, a huge drop, but it could be relevant in some key seats with a high Muslim population. And some within the Labour Party do seem to be worried. A frontbench MP told The Guardian this, Many voters I've spoken to in the area are furious with Starmer's muddling position over his recognition of Palestine statehood. It hasn't gone down well. Fortunately for Labour, the anger isn't quite at the peak of what it was in November. But ultimately, people are still sore, so Labour has its work cut out for them. As well as trouble in the polls, Labour's stance on Gaza has led to interruptions at party events. You'll remember this moment at a fundraiser two weeks ago in Stockport. Thanks, Johnny. And look, Tameside's going to save the world. That's why us three are up here. But, um, the changes is counting. Come when you take a place and asking and demanding for ceasefire. Okay. I lost my family in Gaza. Just a second, I want to show you, Maima. I lost my family in Gaza. If the ceasefire is taking place, can I just and say, I'm not going to What kind and of family is that? I lose my family. I need my mom. That's the only thing I need. Where are you? I need my mom. Where are you? Where are you? Where That was a man holding up a photograph of family members killed in the Gaza war, demanding a ceasefire, then being dragged out by security. Angela Rayner was asked about that moment by Sky's Beth Rigby. Footage emerged last week of you being confronted by protesters about Gaza inside a Labour Party meeting. I watched it. They got really close to you. You had to step in uh, to, to, to block them from getting to a colleague. Um, it was really uncomfortable. We've seen an MP murdered. We've seen MPs murders and death threats are almost commonplace. Mike Freer this week is standing down as an MP because of this. Do you worry about your own safety? Does it make you think twice? I mean, I'm really sad that Mike is standing down, but I can totally understand and appreciate the drip feed of how it is. You can't take one incident in isolation. So for example, that incident, people said, why didn't you just speak to the person? I would have spoke to the person, I'll speak to them one to one, I'll have a conversation. But when you get the levels of abuse and threats that MPs get now, mm. when someone comes at you, you don't know. 
you, you honestly don't know. When someone's shouting and they come over at you, you don't know what's coming. I didn't know what's coming at me. And it did affect me and it has affected me since that incident. No, I have to say, I mean, we were very, very critical of Angela Rayner's response to that protester. And I do stand by that. I think, you know, a better politician would have intervened and said, this guy is showing us, you know, pictures of his family member who have been killed. Don't drag this guy out. I still stand by that. At the same time, I think that context sort of talking about the understandable fear that MPs have, you know, that has changed my perspective somewhat. What I was really annoyed about there, though, was Beth Rigby's question, right, which didn't provide essential context for the audience which is the guy who intervened, who interrupted that talk, had lost family members in Gaza. Just to talk about him like some random protester threatening an MP, I thought was, was, was offensive, actually. I don't want to be too dismissive. When, you know, I know some people are sort of saying, well, what that, you know, think about being in Gaza. Obviously, being in Gaza is a lot worse than being an MP. But I, d- I do understand, especially if you're a female MP, why you might feel unsafe and worry about your safety. We have had two MPs killed in you know, the very recent past. So I don't think it's unreasonable to feel threatened. So I think the first thing that I'd like to say, because I do disagree with you a bit, Michael, is that, yes, I was critical of Angela Rayner's response. The thing I'm more critical of is the way in which a PR operation has kicked in, which is basically activate victim mode. So I don't think that it's justifiable in any way to try and present Angela Rayner, a politician whose job it is to engage with the public, to present her as a greater victim than a guy who has lost his mother and his brother and his brother's children in Gaza. But that's exactly what the Labour Party have decided to push, this exact narrative, because it's a way of neutralizing or trying to, in fact, demonize the criticism that they're receiving over their handling of the Gaza crisis. And it's a narrative which is false, but it's being pushed in collaboration with the mainstream media because it adds up to one essential thing, which is Muslims equal scary. And that's a narrative that mainstream media are really quite happy to push. There's nothing that politicians and mainstream journalists love more than trying to turn political differences, political uh, opposition into a matter of politician physical safety. And it's something that we see time and time again, a collapsing of difference from being criticised and being held accountable to being threatened for your safety. And I think that that's a really important distinction to maintain. As for whether or not this is going to be a big deal electorally for the Labour Party, it has the potential to be. I'm not going to over egg the pudding and say Labour's chances of a majority are finished. But this is why it has the potential to be a big deal. There are millions of Muslims in this country. It's a pretty sizable ethnic minority community. And unlike other ethnic minority communities, such as the Afro-Caribbean community, where you find Muslims geographically is a bit more dispersed. So you've got quite, you know, significant Muslim populations in lots of different places around the country, rather than simply being piled up in the same constituencies in the country's, you know, big cities and significant urban centres. So that changes the sort of electoral impact that Muslims can potentially have. The second thing, of course, is that religious communities of any stripe are highly organised. And we've seen it when it's come to the turnout uh, at the Palestine demonstrations, the largest ones, of course, taking place in London and Birmingham and Manchester. You often have a lot of Muslims who are, you know, coming to these protests, not simply, uh, you know, off their own steam, but because coaches and travel have been arranged via mosques and prayer centres. And so this is quite important when you're thinking about what kind of fallout can this have electorally. You've got a community who are geographically quite spread out um, and who are highly organised. So that is something that can spell trouble for Labour. I think one thing that we're seeing is that I think the mainstream media are sort of torn about how they present this. Today's been kind of the first day that the likes of Channel 4 and, you know, LBC and ITV are taking this matter of Muslim dissatisfaction with Keir Starmer seriously. 
before this point, they were quite happy to demonise dissatisfied Muslim voters as either anti-Semites who are alienated by Keir Starmer's new tough stance on party anti-Semitism, or in the case of uh, the Batley and Spend by-election as, you know, raging conservative homophobes. And while I don't think that, you know, your average voter necessarily pays loads and loads of attention to the news and is going to be aware of every single negative briefing that Labour has put out against Muslim voters. There have been a lot of really negative briefings and at some point that's going to filter through. You have a combination of factors at play here, which is one, you have a truly appalling response by the Labour leadership when it comes to Israel and Gaza. What Keir Starmer did was offer a carte blanche to Israel when it came to cutting off food, fuel and water, and then doing a kind of panicky backpedal when there was a lot of blowback about that particular fact. You've had a quite shameful, I think, following after American foreign policy, which, if you're a British Muslim, is never going to spell anything good. You know, we can remember the war on terror. And so those policy factors, I think, have combined with an overall sense that's coming from the Labour Party of we don't need your vote. We don't even like your vote. In fact, your vote embarrasses us. You know, you're the bad ethnicity, you're the homophobes and you're the sexists and you're the anti-Semites and we don't even like you. You know, Muslim bashing has been one of the, you know, most consistent themes of anonymous Labour Party briefings since Keir Starmer, you know, took over the leadership in 2020. So I think those things really combine. You've got Labour leadership who have been saying in pretty much every way, but, you know, directly quoted material, we don't like you. And you've got policies which are deeply offensive to many Muslim people's morality, just as it's offensive, I should say, to many other British people's morality too. But those two things, I think, have combined to a quite significant effect. In a desperate attempt to turn his premiership around, Rishi Sunak has sat down with Piers Morgan. It didn't go well. NHS waiting lists. We have not made enough progress. You failed on that pledge. Yes. Because you said NHS waiting lists will fall. Uh, in fact, they are slightly coming down now, that, but the well, wages is still nearly half a million yeah. more than it was at the start of last year. Yeah. You accept that? But yes, and we all know the reasons for that. Uh, what I would say to people is, look, we've invested record amounts in the NHS, more doctors, more nurses, more scanners. All these things mean that the NHS is doing more today than it ever has been, but industrial action has had an impact. And in November, you talked about this, mm. in November we had a month where there was no strikes for the first time. Yeah. And do you know what happened to the waiting list? They fell by almost 100,000. Yes, there are problems in the NHS, but it's all the fault of the doctors. It's all the fault of the doctors. They're the problem with the NHS. I don't think people are going to buy that, right? When he says, we all know why that is. We all know why it's not going very well in the NHS. Well, the reason it's not going very well is because you squeezed it of money for a decade. Then we had a pandemic and it fell on its face, right? Now they are putting more money into the NHS. But when you sort of flood a system which has been starved for so long... um, it doesn't tend to sort of work particularly efficiently. Obviously, they could flood it with a bit more money and get the nurses and, sorry, the doctors um, back to work by giving them the pay rise I think they probably deserve. Um, this was the grossest part of the interview, though. If I said to you, I'll bet you a £1,000 to a refugee charity, you don't get anybody on those planes before the election. Will you take that bet? Well, I, well, I want to get the people on the planes, oh, right? Of course I want to get the people on the planes. £1,000. Right? Pounds. right, I want to get the people on the planes. Ugh. Rishi Sunak, the richest prime minister ever, shaking hands with Piers Morgan with a thousand pound bet um, that some presumably rather desperate people will be unwillingly on a plane to Rwanda. Ash, um, what did you make of that? If I speak, I will get in big trouble. All I can say is that it's two incredibly wealthy men with more money than they have humanity turning what is a matter of life and death for asylum seekers into a media spectacle. Now, that's what we've come to expect from Piers Morgan. That's his entire MO. But for Rishi Sunak, I think that it embodies his desperation to be liked, even when he's wandering into a trap. This is not going to turn out well for him. If he wins the bet, he will come off incredibly callous and if he loses the bet 
he is a political failure. A smarter politician would have realised that, but he's like that kid who wants to get really chummy with the bully, not realising that it's going to be his head flushed down the toilet next. Someone's pointed out in the comments, I think quite fairly, Vicky Klee says, it's not a pay rise, Michael, it's pay restoration. Happy to be corrected there. Thank you, Ash, for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Come back tomorrow for another show from 6pm. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.